What is up guys, this is Luke Hill for Kickeroo and there have been murmurs of Sapphire returning to the CPU cooling market for quite a while and well, here we have it. They've gone high end, Acer Tech 7th gen, 240mm all-in-one, 360mm all-in-one. So they're not just going for high end, they're going for pretty high end indeed with some uber high speed fans that they say use a Nitro Plus hybrid fan blade design. Could be impressive. I actually remember reviewing the Sapphire Vapor X cooler back in late 2012. So this is like a trip down memory lane looking at another set of CPU coolers from the vendor. Now granted these are high performance all-in-one liquid coolers. That was an air cooler. But yeah, it's an interesting change for Sapphire. Which fundamentally is probably a pretty good cooling company if you think about it. Yes, they make graphics cards. But what do they really do? They make good coolers on the graphics cards. So there's one to think about I guess. But anyway, that's enough for the nostalgia. Let's take a look at these £139 and £169 all-in-one liquid coolers from Sapphire. Before we do that though, if you like what we do here at Kickeroo, give us a like and subscribe. Support the YouTube channel however you can. Please do check out the Kickeroo website, that really helps us out. And if you want to buy a cool t-shirt or Discord or Patreon, anything like that, then you know what to do. Let's get back into it. After opening the world's most securely packaged box, yes I did cut my finger trying to do this, but... That's probably more of a reflection on me, in all honesty. I'm going to try and do it on camera. Oh my word, why is this so difficult? The joys of having big fingers. There we go. So once you've opened the box, you get the installation guide. That's actually very comprehensive and easy to follow, so that's good. You get a bunch of accessories. Obviously, these are mountain hardware. You actually get Intel LGA 1700, so if you've got a new 12th gen chip, you can run this cooler out of the box. You get one of the breakout cables for powering the fans. Obviously you get a couple of fans in the version for 240mm, three fans in the 360mm. And then obviously you get the radiator pump unit itself. And Sapphire actually uses protective covers to protect the radiator fins. That's really cool, I haven't seen that before. And I should point out here that we're going to switch between the 240mm and 360mm liquid cooler interchangeably in the video on the B-roll, just because they're practically the same units, other than the number of fans and the size, of course. With all of the gubbins out of the way and the protective packaging removed, again, particularly good protective packaging on the radiator, you even get covers to prevent fingerprints on the side, then we can have a closer look. So, of course, 240mm or 360mm radiator, this is a conventional 27mm thick aluminium radiator, despite Sapphire's promotional material saying 52mm, that's obviously the dimensions with the 25mm fans added on. Now of course the radiator is black in colour and it's pretty much a typical design as far as fin density goes when we look at Acetec style radiators. And the length of the tubing is 400mm with the typical sleeving added for aesthetic preferences, but also some performance enhancements. Now the EPDM tubing, even with the sleeving on top, is still actually pretty flexible so you can angle this in some quite aggressive turns and that's good if you're mounting in perhaps a smaller chassis or a more restricted chassis but you still do get the beneficial appearance of the sleeve-in in my opinion. Given the 7th gen Acetec pump design it comes as no surprise that we've got a standard copper cold plate. This is round in form, comes with a blob of pre-applied thermal paste and I must say I quite like this cold plate from Acetec because it's just kind of bulletproof and it seems to work with most platforms, excluding high-end desktop. It's not particularly great there. The Acetec 7th Gen variable speed pump can operate at 800 to 2800 RPM. Sapphire quotes this unit's noise output as 20 dBA maximum. There's plenty of flexibility with regards to mounting orientation because you get a really good turn on the entry points for the tubing. But the pump itself is physically large at 76 by 73 by 59 millimeters. This pump's height is increased by the organic spider pump cap design, which, yeah, okay, it does look pretty unique and pretty reasonable in my opinion. But yeah, that organic spider design is a bit quirky, I guess we'll say. One area that I'm really not fond of is the sheer number of cables in the package. I mean, come on, seriously? This is an all-in-one liquid cooler, and excluding the fans, this is the bundle I have to deal with. What? The pump features no less than six, six cables exiting it. So you've got two four-pin fan headers, you've got a SATA power connector, you've got a proprietary fan connection cable for the Sapphire fans, and then you've got two RGB cables, one of which is an extender. That's a lot. And I think Sapphire needs to do a better job at designing these to be sleek and stealthy, because the best way I could do was just trailing them across the motherboard. 
These need to be either integrated with the sleeve in, perhaps making the tube a bit thicker so that they can be subtly hidden up there, or they need to be sleeved themselves and bundled into one overarching cable route, which then breaks out on the back side of the motherboard tray. Realistically, this is a bit of a mess. Plus, you get another cable, just for fun, which is only partially braided. <laughs> Seriously, that's a lot. Focusing now on the dual ball bearing 120mm fans, these units use the Sapphire Nitro Plus hybrid fan blade design that is featured on the vendor's RX 6000 series graphics card coolers. This effectively translates into Sapphire using a combination between a blower and an axial style fan to try and get some of the benefits of both with minimal compromise when it comes to noise output. So some of the benefits will be that these 12 bladed units that are rated for 450 to 2400 RPM, fantastic speed range, because the blades are all linked together on the outer perimeter, then you are probably gonna get some good columnar cooling effect for the airflow. So that could be beneficial for focusing the pressure through the radiator, which is particularly important with a dense fin array, of course. While the 450 to 2400 RPM speed range is fantastic, especially on that top end, because when you really need cooling performance, 2400 RPM will deliver. I'm not really a fan of the proprietary, excuse the pun, I just realized, not a fan, pun, oh, it's terrible, terrible. I'm not a fan of the proprietary connector. Yes, I don't like proprietary connectors. If one of these fans breaks outside of warranty period, good luck getting a new one. And it just limits you if you wanted to switch to something like a Noctua fan, for example. However, I will give Sapphire some credit that one cable connection for powering the fan, controlling the speed, and also running the RGB light in, that is a benefit. So proprietary, a bit hit or miss in my opinion, but I will give Sapphire the benefit of the doubt here. This is probably a good implementation. Oh yeah, and you get some rubber dampers on the corner of the fan to try and mitigate some of the vibrations that could cause noise output. AM4 installation for Sapphire's cooler basically couldn't be any easier. It's default Acer Tech design. You unclip the front plastic brackets on the AM4 motherboard, hold the back plate in place, and then screw in the Acer Tech style standoffs. Once this is done, you simply pop off the plastic cover on the copper cold plate, drop the cooling block onto the CPU, and then lock it in position with the four thumb screws. It's that easy. Then, once you're ready, you just mount the radiator to your chassis, and then you install the fans. That part is as simple as simple could be. However, the complexity does ramp up quite quickly from that point onwards. And the reason I say that is because now you have the complete mess of cables to deal with. So yeah, okay, it's not particularly difficult to connect them or to route them, but trying to route them cleanly and stealthily, that is quite difficult, especially because some of these cables are actually quite short. So yes, we managed to just trail them across the motherboard up and over the top wasn't ideal in some scenarios and then you've also got the breakout fan cable to deal with so yes lots of cables needs to be a cleaner way of routing it but the end approach is pretty good and i say that with a bit of a huff in my voice because this is not very optimized not very efficient but it does work so i will give sapphire credit there one point i did like though was that sapphire labels the fan connectors one two and three and labels the fans one two and three this is ideal for just knowing which fan goes where and which connects where, which will be good for the RGB and also the speed control. RGB lighting is handled by your motherboard vendor's specific software, but as far as RGB lighting quality goes, I think Sapphire has done a good job here. The lighting is bright, it's smooth, and I really do actually quite like the way that the fan blades illuminate, probably because they're colored white and there's so many of them. I like the ripple effect you get when the fans are rotating. And I think the lighting on the pump block unit is Subtle, but it's enough to see that it's actually there and it looks pretty good. So that's my opinion, but I want to hear your opinion on the RGB lighting in the comment section down below. Our test system is built around the AMD Ryzen 9 5950X processor using PBO and also a moderately clocked overclock, but one that's pretty high power. So that's 4.45 gigahertz, 1.312 volts in the BIOS. And this is about 1.3 volts delivered under load in the system. And that's about 210 watts plus just for the CPU, so pretty hefty load indeed. The motherboard is a Gigabyte B550 Aorus Master with its fantastic VRM. We use a Seasonic TX1000 one kilowatt titanium rated power supply for clean power. 
We've got a Gigabyte RTX 2060 Super graphics card operating in zero decibel mode. And the chassis is a Fractal Design Meshify 2 with three stock 140 millimeter fans for cooling two intake, one exhaust. For testing, we use a 30 minute loop run of Cinebench R23 multi-core and record the steady state temperature at the end of that test run. For our performance testing in this one, we are gonna focus on the Nitro Plus S360A, simply because we like 360 millimeter high-end liquid coolers and we think they're a bit more interesting. Plus at 169 pounds in the UK, this is actually probably more competitively priced than the 139 240 millimeter version. So we're gonna put the focus on this for testing. As always, if you want more information on our test procedure, the setup, all that good stuff, head on over to the Kikuru website. Let's jump into the performance numbers. Let's start off with noise performance of the Sapphire Nitro Plus S360A at full 100% fan speed. This is important for getting an indication of raw, all out performance from the CPU cooler, even when noise is just blasted through in the charts. Noise output is, well, dreadfully high. This shouldn't really come as a surprise with the Nitro Plus S360A using a trio of 2400 RPM fans and a 2800 RPM pump. With noise output levels that were actually quite irritating at full speed, we think Sapphire will certainly need to deliver when it comes to cooling performance. Of course, the fan speed range is 450 to 2400 RPM with PWM control, and the pump has speed control abilities too. So this chart just highlights maximum noise output, which is indeed really high. Our overclocking test is the primary thermal stress test for the CPU cooler. We push pretty hard, the system is pulling well over 300 watts from the wall and the CPU is pulling 210 to 220 watts plus often. So this is a pretty demanding stress test. Here, frequency and voltages on the CPU are fixed, so the coolers are directly comparable to one another. Note the use of delta temperatures in the chart. And I guess we now get the other side of the noise versus performance equation. And this is where Sapphire's new 360mm all-in-one delivers exceptionally well. Spinning its three 120mm fans at full speed, the Sapphire Nitro Plus S360A is able to position itself at the top of our overclocked Ryzen 9 5950X cooling chart. It does so by beating out another Acetec based cooler with high-speed fans and a high RPM pump, that's the Fantex Glacier 1 360MP. Put simply, if you have a highly demanding cooling workload, such as an overclocked Ryzen 9 5950X putting out over 220 watts of heat, the Sapphire Nitro Plus S360A will deliver exceptional levels of performance. It is loud, but the performance is there in copious amounts. Having assessed the overclock performance at full fan speed, now we want to see how the cooler performs with a 40 dBA noise lock in place. This basically allows us to look at the efficiency in some respects of how the cooler performs without just using really high speed, really loud fans to blast its way to the top, which does have merit when you need the cooling performance, but it's perhaps um, not as efficient as some of the alternative cooling approaches. In order to get the unit run at 40 dBA, we had to crank the fans all the way down to 45% duty cycle. We left the pump at its full 2800 RPM speed as its proportion of noise output is not significant. This 45% duty cycle registered as 1200 RPM on the fans, so there is plenty of headroom available if the cooler power needs ramping up. And let's check out how the thermal performance is with the fans locked at their 40 dBA output. Here we see some degree of cooling efficiency for the units tested. Even with over half the speed cut off its fans, the Sapphire Nitro Plus S360A still does well at handling our overclocked Ryzen 9 5950X, but it cannot quite maintain its top of the chart position. This time, Sapphire slots in just behind the Fractal 360 all-in-one and level with the Fantex competitor. There's also a 360mm Acetec unit. This tells us that Sapphire's choice of fan is very good in terms of noise efficiency, but not quite as strong as the 120mm blowers used by Fractal, for example. Now we're going to look at Precision Boost Overdrive data. Remember that this locks the CPU to a maximum of 90 degrees Celsius, so temperature differences here are not all that critical unless they're also viewed through the lens of frequency and power delivered. And when I say power delivered, I basically mean package power, because in this one, higher package power cooled by the cooler is actually better when combined with lower temperature and higher frequency. So yes, you've got the trifecta there. Make sure you read the data correctly. And we'll try and analyze it with what we say. Jumping back to full fan speed data with precision boost overdrive testing, the Sapphire Nitro Plus S360A once again positions itself at the top of our chart. Yes, this is a case of Sapphire blasting its way above the other coolers with faster fans and therefore higher noise output, 
but that will be relevant to users who need that top end cooling power when their processor's heat output really ramps up. Here, Sapphire's Acetec based cooler is very slightly better than the Fantex competitor. This is by virtue of a minuscule increase in managed CPU package power and a minor increase to the associated chip frequency. And now, looking at VRM temperatures for our manually overclocked 5950X and Gigabyte B550 Aorus Master motherboard, Sapphire does exceptionally well, somewhat surprisingly. Unsurprisingly though, is that Asus tops the chart thanks to an equipped high-performance VRM fan on the pump block unit. But Sapphire is only a few degrees behind and is notably above the Arctic Liquid Freezer 2 360 with its less capable integrated VRM fan. This is more nuanced than Sapphire's high-speed fans simply blast into the top of the chart, as proven by the data from the Fantex competitor. Instead, it looks like the advertised Nitro Plus hybrid fan blade design is actually proven useful for enhancing VRM cooling with our specific chassis, positioning and motherboard heatsink setup. With the fans dropped down to 40 dBA noise level though, we do see quite a reduction in performance that puts Sapphire's unit more in line with the rest of our test pack. There we have it then. Performance from the Sapphire Nitro Plus S360A all-in-one liquid cooler is impressive. Built around the Acetec 7th generation pump design and the 27mm thick aluminium radiator, Sapphire uses a tried and tested approach for an all-in-one liquid cooler. The fans do a good job, particularly at their high speed 2400 RPM operation. Yes, this makes the cooler very loud, but it also gives you excellent headroom for dissipating heat when it's really needed. Plus, you can use the ample speed range to balance between noise and performance, because even when locked to 40 dBA, the all-in-one still performs well. In terms of styling, Sapphire's ARGB lighting is smooth and bright and really well lit in my opinion. No, the package isn't as proficient as some of the new LCD pump unit coolers on the market, but you don't get that level of expense either. As I've already made clear several times, I was not impressed by the sheer quantity of cables leaving the pump block design, especially because of the positioning of the pump block with regards to your system. Just hiding these and making them tidy is gonna be really challenging. Looking at the downside though, Sapphire's warranty is really not very good for a £139 240mm cooler or a £169 360mm liquid cooler. The pump, radiator and tubing are warrantied for two years and the fans themselves are warrantied for three years. That really doesn't cut it in the late 2021 market at this price point. Competitors from the likes of Arctic, Fractal, Corsair, NZXT, they're all offering far superior warranties, so I think that does need to be looked into and factored in with your purchasing decision. And then if we move on to price, I'd say that's a point for debate. Now, £169 for the 360mm liquid cooler is a bit on the steep side, but when you factor in the Acetec 7th gen design, which we know is expensive, but the performance is good, as we've seen, you've got really high-performance, high-speed fans on there, and the RGB lighting is good, even if you don't get one of those LCD screens that's even more expensive, then yes, it's still expensive and it's kind of high-end NZXT and Corsair RGB cooler territory, but the performance, in our opinion, backs up Sapphire's pricing. So yeah, expensive, but perhaps justifiably so in many respects. So there we have it. I'd say that Sapphire has done a very good job at offering up an all-in-one liquid cooler with high performance abilities overall and very few compromises as well as a good overall design package and smooth RGB lighting. Yep, they've done a good job. Pretty expensive at 169 and the warranty does need a bit of an improvement in my opinion, or if you don't care, then absolutely fine. But overall, I'm impressed by this. So roll on Sapphire's next model because this one is a good job. I've been Luke Hill for Kikaru. Thank you for watching our video review of the Sapphire Nitro Plus S240A and the S360A. Let us know what you think in the comment section down below. Is this an impressive start to the all-in-one liquid cooling market for Sapphire? let us know. If you like this video, give us a like and subscribe, do all that YouTube stuff, support us on Patreon, Discord, keep an eye out for our Christmas and New Year content, check out the website as always, and I'll see you next time.